So, I'll be talking about acute ankle sprains. Um, I'm going to be a little sad because half of what I do for presentations is make try and find funny memes. And so <laughs> now my memes will be on delay for you guys. Um, but that's okay. So overall, we're just doing a fast anatomy review and a review of ankle sprains, um, sort of the mechanism injury, things not to miss. Um, the first article um, is a consensus statement. Um, so not the, I guess, um, strongest in terms of evidence base, but it's a, it's a statement sort of um, to try and guide what we do in terms of our getting our, to our diagnosis of an ankle sprain, and then... Um, what things we maybe should consider adding in our assessment once we reach that diagnosis. And the second article uh, is looking at non-invasive neural stimulation uh, in the treatment of an acute lateral ankle sprain. So I'll summarize both articles, talk about sort of how I felt um, they, they might guide us in terms of our, um, our practice or strengths and weaknesses, um, and then time for questions. Uh, so just to review the ankle anatomy, so it's consisting of the talocural joint, the uh, inferior tibiofibular joint with the syndesmosis, and then the subtalar joint as well. And those three sort of make up the movements that we consider to be in the ankle, um, with a lot of it coming from the talocural joint. And this is just, obviously, uh, ligaments of the uh, ankle, so medial and lateral views, um, and just showing that ATFL, which is our usual culprit, as well as the calcaneofibular, which we also like to look out for, and then the deltoid, a nice fan-shaped ligament uh, on the other, on the medial side. Um, it also shows the a, uh, AITFL, which should be indicated in like a higher ankle sprain. Uh, so you can grade ankle sprains, much as we grade any type of sprain, uh, based on laxity. So grade one would be considered to be normal laxity, but um, like pain uh, with stressing the ligament um, and tenderness in terms of your exam. Two is increased laxity, but still with a firm endpoint. And then three, they're describing it as no, no firm endpoint and gross uh, instability or laxity. Uh, the ATFL is the most common to be sprained laterally, um, and it at baseline tolerates less of a strain before it uh, um, fails than uh, the CFL. Um, and typically, that is our what we think of as the rolled ankle. Uh, we commonly see so inversion and plantar flexion. Medial injuries tend to be much less common, and they tend to be forced inversion injuries. Um, and the other way that that can happen is uh, an actual impact to the lateral ankle, which causes, well planted, which causes you to go into a varus bilateral valgus. Um, and then this is my first funny meme that you'll see far later than I wanted you to. But there are other things you want to rule out when you get to, uh, um, to get to assess these, these injuries in these people. So we will use, we always rely on our Ottawa anchor rules, um, and that uh, image just summarizes what those are. Um, basically trying to rule out fracture in the foot, so uh, navicular, base of the fifth, and then also um, medial and lateral mal, malleoli, sorry. Um, and so your Ottawa foot and ankles will guide you on whether or not you need an x-ray. Um, in addition to that, so other than just ruling out a fracture, you also want to rule out an osteochondral injury. Um, so an effusion in the ankle might change what you're thinking versus um, whether there's no effusion, just lateral or swelling, um, and then a syndesmotic injury or a high ankle sprain. Um, and mechanism would, uh, sorry, not mechanism, and you're going to, um, so it's usually a hyper, like an isolated hyper dorsiflexion force, um, and that's an not as common mechanism, um, but seen often in sports like football. So our typical management approach, um, there's still some controversy on whether or not we should be immobilizing. Um, so some it's sometimes suggested that you still immobilize. Um, we try and do compression to manage the um, soft tissue swelling. Um, and then you have the option to brace, uh, especially for our un more unstable patients, so higher grade sprains. Um, we know now that we want to get them earlier into their uh, active range of motion, and then as fast as we sort of can start working on balance, proprioception, and strengthening of the traversing muscles and tendons to try and uh, get that stability back, um, and to prevent chronic instability as well uh, and re-injury. And then an option for higher grades would be a reconstruction. Um, 
as well as that's an option for your kind of your chronic uh, uh, instability picture. Um, and those surgeries um, obviously have their, their pluses and minuses, so it requires a, a good in-depth uh, discussion by the surgeons with the patients on whether or not they feel like it's worth it for them. So the first article is the consensus statement, um, and it's from the International Ankle Consortium. And so they wanted to look at what we should be doing when we're trying to diagnose uh, and then do our initial assessments um, for acute lateral ankle sprains. And they, the idea was to prevent, um, so not so much that they're worried that we're not going to manage, I think, the acute injury so much as they're worried that uh, people who um, don't have some of these components of their assessment maybe miss certain components of the rehabilitation that predispose them to having uh, longer-term sequelae. Um, such as chronic instability. So that was their thought process on this, and this is an article um, published in late 2018, which is why they then threw the 2019 consensus on it. Uh, so there, that's their objective, is to develop recommendations for us to have a structured assessment uh, for acute <coughs> lateral ankle sprains, so considering only lateral injuries. And then their thought process for that was, that, as we said earlier, the most common um, and because it's a, one of the most common MSK injuries in general, uh, they felt there was a high cost associated with, um, so indirect, indirect, so people presenting, um, getting uh, repeated assessments, getting rehabilitation, time from work, time from sport, um, and then the risk of re-injury, so further costs down the road. Um, and they also wanted, because once you've rolled your ankle once, you tend to roll it again, so also for the... Um, high re-injury rates, which lead to a higher risk of uh, chronic ankle instability, or CAI, which I've uh, short-formed here. Um, and they felt that because they're the mechanical and sensory motor impairments of the ankle, once it's been injured, um, play a really heavy role, or um, they contribute heavily to uh, the development of chronic uh, instability, that these assessments need to um, look more closely at whether or not a patient initially exhibits uh, any mechanical or sensory motor impairments. So they use, I'm going to mispronounce this, but either Delphi or Delphi rounds, um, which are how you build consensus statements. So you essentially, you create a list of, um, of questions that you're interested in. People um, talk, people will sort of rank them on importance um, and describe, and then from there, you would take the most important ones and move them on to the next round, um, in my understanding. So it's a common technique used for uh, consensus building. Um, for this group, their total was uh, 14 participants, so it's the executive committee of the Anchor Consortium. Um, so already a pretty low um, sample size or, or like contributing group. Um, I thought it was interesting that the number of uh, acute ankle, lateral ankle injuries that people in the ankle consortium would see in a year was 40. Um, it just seemed like not, not a high number, but uh, they are probably people that treat uh, chronic instability as well. And then at that point, once they did their first round, they collated those responses and presented them at their executive meeting uh, at their annual meeting. So 10 of that 14 returned, and then they went through them in person to try and develop their consensus statement. Um, so from round one, they considered anything with above a 75% agreement. Uh, it got automatically included. It didn't go through round two to be discussed further. It just was, was in as one of their recommendations. And partial agreement got assessed again at that second meeting. Um, and at that point, if on discussion, so if the group of us were sitting and discussing and building off of the ideas and I'm getting suggestions from Samit on why he felt that was more important and I had ranked it as a two on my Likert. The idea is that at that point if the adjusted overall Likert was above 75% um, then it would be included as well in the consensus statement. Um, and that led them to build two different things. So they built a clinical diagnostic assessment which I think everyone here will see isn't necessarily groundbreaking, I don't think. Like, it, it's kind of how we would structure it anyways. And then some of their um, assessment, the other aspects of the assessment once you've done the diagnosis. Um, and some of those were interesting additions, and that's what they gave the acronym ROAST to. Um, 
That number, that was number of ankle sprains. That's what it said. Yeah, that was their like mean number uh, in a year. Ankle sprains. It, I think it just said ankle sprains. Originally, I thought that was low, but if you actually think about it, it's probably because I mean, the, uh, ankle injuries is definitely far greater than that. I mean, how would you see a week, right? So then multiply by most of the benefit from these researchers. And that's and that's another problem. very fair, yeah. So are they people that are even clinically practicing as, and are these like their current numbers versus, and are the other usually, if, if you're a foot and ankle surgeon, then you might not be in a clinic where you're seeing acute. Like you're seeing the people who are being referred on yeah. more likely. Um, yeah, I thought that was a low number as well. But that's with my bias of being in like in a, like the varsity clinic and mm -hmm. where we're seeing all the students. And, yeah. Um, so for the clinical diagnostic assessment, like I said, it, it, it's not that's not so. I mean, that, it's it's not groundbreaking. I think it's the stuff that most of us probably do when we're doing <coughs> these assessments. So. They identified five essential elements, and one was to, to determine the mechanism of injury and that that was important to um, help you rule out a syndesmotic sprain um, or a lateral injury, um, and would help you sort of then go on to do a further assessment of the tissues. Um, they also suggested uh, that they wanted to know whether there was a previous injury, and that would help you, I think, down the road rule out um, whether or not there'd be ongoing uh, sensory motor and mechanical impairments for, uh, down the road, um, and also multiple injuries is an even higher risk for recurrent injuries because you're already having them. Um, they suggest doing Ottawa foot and ankle uh, to assess the bones and weight-bearing status, um, and an assessment of the ligaments themselves. Great case yesterday from the merge. And this is why the mechanism in auto ankles is a pass along, I'll put it up on the website, but this is you know not every time somebody comes in with an ankle injury or they might refer to it as a sprain, but when you ask the questions, they'll they won't have any kind of mechanism of like inversion or inversion. Um, this is a, a woman that was running straight line on a gymnasium and uh, felt a pop. Now, on my ankle was negative, no tenderness on any of those spots. And then as you see here, I don't keep it as it to be negative. No, no, no oddly, that's true. This, this is like, I, I, I spoke to the foot and ankle guy, I'm like, what's the largest uh, keyboard evolution factor you've seen? He's like, oh, you can get five millimeters. I'm like, how about one by one, one <laughs> centimeter by five millimeters? Like, I, I see. Have, I think like, I might have to screw that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. But, yeah. Just to highlight the yeah, that's interesting. Of, uh, <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I like that they um, they kind of break down. It sounds ridiculous, but I like I like that they broke down why we're doing certain things into and and the um, emphasis on the mechanism as well. Um, and then so from there they um, did some good jigsaw work to get a, a cool acronym like roast and uh, brought us through the, the what they would do in the assessment. And so this is going to appear very very tiny when it finally shows up, um, but essentially. Um, what they're looking for people to include when they're doing the assessment after they've reached that diagnosis is ankle joint pain and swelling. Um, and they're talking, so partially, it's ankle joint swelling is in an effusion, but I think they're also talking about the degree of soft tissue as well, um, range of motion, and then the kinematics of the joint itself, which they term arthrokinematics. Um, and then they're doing a muscle strength assessment um, Static balance assessment, postural dynamic balance assessments, um, a gait analysis, not like with a force plate, et cetera, et cetera, but just you watching them walk. Um, and then they wanted to do, um, so I think then they've asked for the patients to actually do like a functional assessment of where they feel they are in time and space. Um, and this table, um, if you get a chance to look at it, because it is really blurry, but they sort of give their. Um, the reasoning behind why you would include uh, some of these things in your assessment. Um, some of it wouldn't take much time, and a few of them are things that we already do, uh, so like a, a tailored glide or a tailored tilt. Um, <coughs> but for the muscle strength, they actually want like a, 
like a force reading and number, so they want you to have a dynamometer with you. Um, the balance testing, BESS is one of them. I guess you have a quantitative idea, but what's interesting is that you don't have a pre. So my 87-year-old grandma's dynamometer reading probably isn't going to be the same pre-ankle as mine, pre-sprain as mine was. Maybe not me because I'm very sedentary and lazy now. But Can you do that for any other joint assessment? No, I think this is, I don't think, so there's, I think the question is, is does this need to be this in, intense or this thorough and I don't think it necessarily does um, that was one of their I think that's how they're saying you would like quantitatively do it I, I think you can also do a rough comparison to the contralateral limb um, yeah and so that's sort of what they suggested that we include on our like, general lateral ankle sprain assessments um, so the strengths of this paper um, is that most of their statements when you go through are supported. Not so much in that assessment portion, but there is some, there is good support for what they're sort of suggesting that we, we assess, at least in terms of the domains. I'm not saying that using a dynamometer is the requirement, but I think no one would argue that you should be assessing, the strength would be a portion of your assessment to determine like back to play and um, readiness to resume activities. Um, the 75% aspect of it, um, I thought was a, like, a relatively high cutoff um, on a group of 14, depending on, in terms of, there can be a lot of groupthink and consensus uh, in, in that setting. So if you have a few uh, loud speakers who are very adamant that something's not going to be um, included, I feel like it's a bit like jury duty and that you may have people who are like, who aren't that invested in are kind of like fine, yeah. Um, and I think this also could help form a basis for further work into whether including those things in assessments actually changes how you manage these patients, and if so, does that change our outcome in terms of chronic instability and, and recurrent injuries? Um, and I think I've already suggested some of the um, limitations already as we sort of went through. And the other thing is just that it may be overkill, but also it's some of those push, some of those aspects would be quite time consuming to actually work into a general ankle assessment after you've already been doing your diagnosis there. Um, and it's something that we sometimes, I can sometimes take for granted on a schedule as being something that's gonna be a faster visit. Um, so yeah, um, I think definitely a structured approach um, and maybe not so much I think, I think we all have structured approaches without necessarily needing this, but for people who don't see ankles that often, um, it's not bad to have a suggestion for a structured approach. Um, and I do think the ROAST does have the opportunity of giving a lot of information about um, where the sort of deficits lie and, and things that you can target with, with rehab, whether or not they all need to be targeted and whether or not they're all useful. I'm not, I'm not so sure. The second article is looking at uh, non-invasive neurostimulation and looking at whether that uh, improves short-term recovery and return to sport. And these were all professional contact athletes that they included in this. Um, and so the goal of this research or the aim of it was to determine whether NIN is effective in treating acute uh, lateral ankle sprain specifically. And they did that with respect to ankle function, uh, return to sport, so time to return to sport, and then lower severity of pain. Um, and they've used, so there have been studies and trials for NIN in other joints, and so the idea was very specifically, but it hasn't been done for ankles, so we got to see if it is useful there, which is fine. Um, so they had an assessor and patient-blinded randomized controlled trial, um, it was their approach, uh, and the patients were randomized, so it was, it's a small sample size, which you'll see, and so because of that, to try... Um, I think to make the groups as similar as they could, they didn't randomize, it was randomized almost by blocks, so they put a block of patients together and then randomized that block of patients. Um, and they were either put into the treatment, which is the neurostim, uh, or a sham group. The inclusion criteria for uh, the uh, patients in it were that they were all pro athletes uh, in soccer, football, basketball, and mixed martial arts. Um, 
this had to be their first episode of an acute lateral ankle sprain, which I feel like would take a lot of the people who've gotten that far in those sports out. Um, and it had to occur during a sporting activity. Um, they needed to have been seen and enrolled in the trial within 48 hours of the injury occurring. And based on clinical ultrasound or MRI, uh, they needed a diagnosis of a grade one or two tear. Um, there could not be any bony edema, couldn't be any uh, skin wounds, um, and those are sort of what the injury needed to entail, and they had to be adults. And then things that wouldn't get you invited to the party, other than people that don't meet those criteria, um, was a history of recurrent dislocation or hyperlaxity of any joint. <laughs> so if you were someone who had multiple shoulder injuries in hockey, you would be out. Um, any form of local physio um, or systemic anti-inflammatories in the two months prior to this injury. Um, if they admitted to anabolic steroid use, they were out. So hopefully everyone's honest. Um, and anything that they felt could limit um, them safely using the neurostimulation. So a pacemaker, um, a neurostimulator, um, and then any sort of um, impairment cognitively that would um, change their ability to consent as they went through. So um, this is, I felt like a little wild here. Uh, so everybody that uh, consented to enter this trial had two weeks of immobilization and then because of that they all had DVT prophylaxis um, with a DOAC. Um, they were placed, <laughs> right? <laughs> That escalated quickly. <laughs> uh, they were put in an incomplete plaster cast and then also placed on NSAIDs. And then after this, two weeks of joy, they were put into either Neurostim or the Sham. <coughs> the therapists themselves were not blinded to who, what they were doing. For, so they had a Sham device, but the therapists knew what they were doing. And part of that is because the way this works is that it measures the impedance and that's how it tells you where you need to target. And I feel like a few years ago, someone showed, like, did this on me to show me sort of how it works. And it felt like once it got to a place that was a little bit inflamed, supposedly the re they could feel also that like, the resistance to them moving it increases, was, the, was what I was told. Um, but you can feel that it starts to get a little uncomfortable in that area when it was happening to, to me, or maybe that was all in my brain. But, um, the impedance reading tells you if you're in the right location. And so, um, and then they had a sham machine that looked like the same thing, but, but wasn't. They received five treatments per week for two weeks, so they had 10 treatments in total. Um, and then they had, so they had a, a scale that was like an inability to walk, so the IWS. Uh, they had their visual analog pain scale. And then they kept track of how many NSAIDs they were using to control their pain, and that um, they sort of monitored that as they went through. And then time for return to sport and complications were also uh, tracked. They did um, a one-week follow-up, so they'd already had five sessions, and then two-week follow-up, 30 days after, and then um, two and four months, I think, there were phone, phone calls to check in to see whether, what, whether they'd return to sport, etc. Um, and then they did linear regression and the stats, uh, math, mathematics to get whether or not there is a significant difference between the groups. So they had 17 athletes who came in with a diagnosis that would, would fit in, into their category, so a grade one or grade two lateral ankle sprain. And then when you go through sort of what their inclusion criteria was, um, they were able to get a, about 30 on each side, so it's uh, 61 in total. Um, and then this is them just comparing their groups at uh, the first three intervals. Uh, they don't include a comparison in a table form, which is a little different for me for randomized control, in terms of their demographics um, at time zero. So they don't actually tell, tell us how matched those groups are, um, but I think they said at some point there was no, there was no major difference. Um, and so here you can see that uh, according to the walk, impaired walking scale, um, there is a significant difference early and then after, um, um, so not at the two week, but at the one month mark. 
I'm sorry. And then uh, the visual analog score again. So that's more, it keeps improving. Um, and there's a significant difference between the uh, stim and the sham group at uh, the T3 mark. Uh, so later on, not so early for that. And then again, uh, with NSAID use at the uh, third time interval, uh, it was significantly differences, different as well. So again, with the uh, neurostim group, it was significantly less statistically. Uh, and then they also found on their phone interviews with athletes that the proportion who returned to sports after two months was significantly higher in the neurostim group compared to the sham group. Um, but at four months, they were no different. So they had 84%, 80 versus 82%. The majority were all back to their sport. And no adverse events uh, were uh, recorded, and that included severe pain and discomfort with, I guess, the treatment it's in and of itself. So it was tolerable for the patients. So from uh, this work, the authors felt that uh, the non-invasive neurostim could improve short-term outcomes for these specific grades of, of lateral ankle injuries and may improve the, so may increase the speed at which you return to sport. Um, and that they, so their argument is that for professional athletes, that's like one of the biggest things is how fast can I get back there or high level athletes. And so there could be um, a value of adding non-invasive neurostimulation as a tool for getting people back to sport uh, sooner and potentially for decreasing the duration of their use of NSAIDs. Um, so I thought, in terms of strengths, um, they blinded as best they could given what's available to them. Um, so the assessors um, for the scores were blinded, for the stats were blinded, uh, the person that did the phone follow-ups was, a, was a, another therapist I think was blinded, and the patients themselves were, were, were blinded. Um, and uh, they do say that there's no significant difference in the demographics um, overall. They did uh, try and be pretty stringent with their um, uh, with their inclusion criteria, with the uh, hopes of avoiding confounding with people with chronic instability. Um, and then I thought they um, they did have uh, oh sorry. I, don't, I think I missed saying that, so at these sessions where they got the neurostim or the sham treatment, they also underwent ph physiotherapy, so st standard, I apologize. Uh, and so I felt that it was important that, that they, there's another studies where I've, I've read, and Sunit's years were pretty good for this too, in terms of people um, still underwent the same active therapies. Um, and I think my last presentation with PRP, they actually had forbidden the patients from undergoing and so I was like that seems weird that you would so I like that they kept that as part of it like they people weren't denied the what we know kind of what we have good evidence for um, limitations it's a um, it's an easy call for me to say sample size so I'll get that one out of the way um, the short follow-up duration but I think that's okay because they're not looking at whether or not this prevents long-term uh, instability their goal, I think, even when they chose this population, was to look at, and I think this is similar to what you were saying for the, the, um, the epicondylitis. Um, do I need to know what they're doing in 10 years from now in terms of did this treatment work? No. I think they've answered on a typical timeline I would need to know about. Um, but I guess it, it, for the sake of academia, some people would feel that was a short follow-up um, duration. Um, and then I think it's not so much that it's a limitation, but I think it's just it's more it's just like picking the correct surgery and the correct patients for surgery. This would be that this would support it for an acute injury and not necessarily for a role further down the road, and that's okay. Um, I think one of the things that I was surprised about was so the immobilization we're hitting this on that and this is our, this is our discussion. A two weeks of immobilization seems like a long time, and then throwing people on anticoagulation seemed. That seems more surprising to me than if someone told me I was going to get a fake blood test done. So, um, luckily, no one had a bad outcome. They're all young and healthy people. Um, and then the other thing I thought was interesting was that it means because you your the NIN tells you where your target source is to not 
actually even have a target for the patients that are getting the sham treatment. Um, depending on what the sham fully was, like there's signal that's emitted when we, like our cell phones emit a signal. Uh, and I don't think that I'm, if I hold my iPhone, I'm going to stimulate healing in my, like in my ATFL. But I think to not even be, if you're putting pressure on the area, even like you're not even putting the same tactile um, pressure to the same areas. Um, so they're not totally comparable. Um, and I think the, the non-blinding of the therapist, if it's the same therapist that's doing, um, that's guiding your active therapy, may or may not be an area for bias. Um, but yeah. So those are the main uh, limitations that I felt. So I think in summary, it did a good, um, I think we, there were no negative outcomes to the neurostimulation. So I think it's a relatively safe um, thing to add into the toolbox and if it can get your um, if it can get athletes back to their activity faster and decrease NSAID use I don't think that's a bad thing to throw into what we're already doing so it it, it bears some consideration I think we could have um, I don't think it's going to be a long-term outcome so much but I think a, a larger power higher powered study might be worthwhile but um, and to be honest uh, pleading or I don't really know what this would run a clinic to, to have um, but for a relatively low risk, it wouldn't, it's not a they bad tool to, we, I don't think we have one, no. I think I saw it in a clinic, like in North York somewhere, and I was doing elective, but yeah. All right, any questions or comments? I love Will Ferrell and Elf, so I always use this. How often thing. you mobilize by the Difficulty with weight bearing, perhaps, but even, even then, I, I, I would Brace. preference to crush and then weight bearing tolerance. Right. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. And I was so surprised at that. Interesting. That was great. Thank you, Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you guys for coming.